Hello everyone, welcome to Mosaic House Online. I want to start by telling you a story from a book called Shame and Grace. This was written by Louis Smees. And in this book, he talks about a couple. Uh, there was in the city of Karpov, Russia, a man named Lech and a woman named, named Chensika. Chensika. Uh, Lech was an aspiring pianist, and his dream, his dream was to become a concert pianist. However, however, because he didn't have the inroads, the connections to the concert world, every night he played at this popular cabaret. Now, Chenska, she had this, this selfless devotion to Lech, and all she wanted, all she wanted, all she wanted was for Lech to become a concert pianist. Chenska was a beautiful and attractive woman, and at the cabaret, uh, there was a, a, a producer of concerts. And Chenska want, wanted to build a friendship with, with him so that he may help Lech to become a concert pianist. Now, in this course of friendship, the producer of concerts found her very attractive, and she was attractive, good looking. So he made her a proposition. He said, if you have sex with me, I will see to it that your boyfriend, your lover, will have his day on the stage. She agreed, and she made good on her bargain, and she slept with him. The producer of concerts also made good on his bargain as well, and, and Lech had his day on the stage. Now, from that on, from, from that point on, Lech went on a, a tour. He became a superstar. However, he never returned to the, to the cabaret. And Chenska was left with this sense of guilt and shame. One morning in, in May, she jumped out of her apartment window to her death. On the mirror, in her apartment, there was this little note of one sentence. I am filth. Friends, what do you do with your guilt and shame? Where do I go with mine? We'll have the sense of guilt and shame because we have made mistakes. Oh, and I only wish they were mistakes. All of us, we commit what's called sin. And this is devastating. And today, I want, I want to talk to you about shame and guilt. And the timing is perfect, because we are in the season of Lent. Lent is a, a Christian calendar, a season in which we remember the suffering, the agony, and the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible explains that Christ had to suffer. He had to agonize, and he had to be crucified to set us free, to do something about your and my guilt and shame. Before we move on, I want to ask the question, uh, what's the difference between guilt and shame? Here's how Louis Smees defines them. We feel guilty for what we do. We feel shame for what we are. Again, we feel guilty for what we do. Guilt is a result of our action. It's what we have done, and that's why we feel guilty. Shame is something that we feel. It's a result of our identity. We feel shame because of what we are. So oftentimes we think, because we, we have committed sin, we feel guilty, and therefore we feel ashamed because we are sinners. I want to take you to, uh, uh, to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is the, the official Bible where there, there, there is prayers, songs, and confessions. We're going to get to Psalm 51. And when you look at the title, Psalm 51, right below it in your Bible, I hope it does, there should be a caption, a description of the context that describing Psalm 51. My Bible says this, For the director of music, or Psalm of David, 
when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. So Psalm 51 is a response from David to the Lord as to what happened regarding his guilt and shame. So allow me to spend a couple of minutes to, to explain to you what happened. Okay? And I pray that you read the whole story, the whole narrative in the second Samuel chapter 11, 12. Okay? Here's what, what occurred. One morning, late at night, the King David, the man after God's own heart, King David couldn't sleep, so he went outside on his palace, and he looked, and he found a beautiful woman, beautiful woman, taking a bath. He sent his servants, find out who that is, because she was attractive. Okay. Now, pause there. Recognizing woman, beautiful, that's not sin. What happens, it becomes a sin, when you say, hmm, she's attractive, you should, you could say, praise the Lord, she's beautiful and attractive. That's not sin. That's just giving God the glory, giving God the praise. But when, when, when David does, and when you and I say, hmm, I want her. I want a piece of that. You see, that's the difference. So let's, let's go on. So King David sends a messenger. Say, hey, find out who that is. And the messenger comes back and says, the servant says, Lord, that is Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, the Bible doesn't say, oh, she is Bathsheba, a wife of somebody. The Bible gives the name of the husband. And that's because Uriah was a loyal, loyal servant, soldier of King David. When King David was fleeing from King Saul, Uriah was one of his faithful, faithful, loyal servants, soldiers. It's not just somebody. It's not just anyone. This is Uriah's wife. But see, this is, this, this is what happens when, when, when we are tempted to sin. Sin begets greater sin. So what does David do? Instead of just walking away from the temptation, he sends, he brings Bathsheba to his chambers, and he slept with her. Bathsheba goes back home. She finds out that she's conceived. She's pregnant. She sends a word to King, King David. Now, King David, he comes up with a scheme now. So he commits adultery, and then rather than repenting of that sin, he tries to cover that up. So he brings Uriah, who at the time was out in the battlefields fighting the enemy. He brings Uriah to his palace. Say, Uriah, go home, wash your feet, and make love to your wife. Take a break. See, he was trying to cover up his sin by coming up with this scheme of sending Uriah home so that he may have uh, sleep with his own wife, and, and, and thereby the, her pregnancy would, would have been thought caused by her own husband. But Uriah doesn't go, go home. He sleeps at the entrance of the palace. Dave call, call, calls him, hey, why haven't you gone home to be with your wife? Uriah says, my men are fighting out in the bad battlefields, and how can I go home, drink, eat, and make love to my wife? No, I will do no such thing. So he slept at the entrance of the palace. What a man, what a contrast between him and King David. The following day, so therefore David comes up with another scheme. He gets Uriah drunk, drunk, hoping that in his drunkenness, he would go home and make love to his wife. But again, this, this man, Uriah, refused to go. Scheme number three, therefore, David sends Uriah back to the battlefields, but then he informs the general, saying, hey, when Uriah goes to fight the enemies, put him in the, the fiercest battle-fighting field, and then withdraw from him so that he may die in the hands of the enemies. And that's exactly what happened. And then once Uriah is dead, killed, 
David brings Bathsheba to his own palace and marries her. Now, that's 2 Samuel chapter 11. In the 12th chapter, in the 12th chapter, God sends the prophet Nathan to David to confront him. And, and when David hears what Nathan had to say, what the Lord had to say, he is struck with remorse, with guilt and shame. In his repentance, he wrote this psalm, Psalm 51. So here, let's read the word of the Lord, Psalm 51, a prayer of David after he committed adultery with Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquity. Friends, would you read verses 10, 11, and 12 with me? Create in me a pure heart, O God, and re renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are God my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, you. God will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous, in burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, write these words by downloading the sermon notes. I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to receive the theme and the goal of this message, which is this. Jesus Christ set you free from guilt and shame through repentance. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Righteous One, the Holy One, the Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus, what does He do about our guilt and sin? Shame, He sets you free from guilt and shame through repentance. And I want to tell you three ways from Psalm 51 how you and I should have true repentance. Number one, repent by admitting your guilt and shame. Admit, confess, agree that you are, God is right when he judges. Look at verse 3 and verse 9. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Verse 9, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. See? True repentance, when you and I repent because of our guilt and shame, we, we do not blame others. We do not make, make excuses. Oh, it was the circumstances. Oh, it was my mother. I am this way because something happened in the past. We do not make excuses. We do not blame others. But in true repentance, we repent by admitting our own guilt and shame, by saying, we own it. I did it. I am at fault. I am responsible. Look at David. I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Look, he says, 
my transgressions, my sins. They're not before me just occasionally, sometimes, only on Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays. No, he says, my, I know my transgressions. They are always before me. He is owning it. He is owning it. And therefore, therefore, it starts with admission. It starts with confession. Now, pause. Stop right here. Some of you might say, hey, you know, all this talk about sin and, and morality. Look, look, uh, morality is subjective. It's re- relative. Some of you are saying this. And certainly all of you know somebody who says morality is, is subjective. We are living in a world, we're living in a time when we are being bombarded with this ideology that there is no absolute morality. What's right for you and what's wrong for me? Well, that depends on who you are. There is no absolute morality. So how should we respond to that? And we must. We must. Two responses. One, philosophically. When someone, when you say there is no absolute morality, and that's because everything is relative. What's, what's right for me? What's right for you? That's all subjective. Okay? Friends, when you say that, you just made an absolute morality. Did you get that? You are saying this is true for everyone. So you just denied, refuted your, refuted your own argument, saying, saying there is no absolute morality. Every, everything is relative and subjective. You just made an absolute moral judgment. Second, more practical. If there is no absolute morality, then how do we make our world, our life, a better place? Case in point. I know that you would agree with me by saying what Russia is doing to Ukraine, that's immoral, that is wrong, that is evil, right? And Putin says, and the nation of Russia says, well, come on now. Morality is subjective. It's relevant. You may think this is wrong, but we think this is right. This is absolutely right. See, we cannot make our world a better place. There is no discourse. There, there, there is no dialogue when there is no absolute morality. Let's, let's continue on. Let's continue on. Okay? So first is, you admit your own guilt and shame. Now, some of you are saying, well, well, hang on, hang on, hang on. David messed up. He sure did. But I have not committed adultery. I have not committed murder. So this really doesn't apply to me. Look, Jesus comes along in Matthew on the Sermon on the Mount. This is what he declares. And this is so convicting. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, 22. Listen. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Rekha, which means moron, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Jesus expounds on the Ten Commandments, which says, you shall not murder, right? You shall not kill anyone. And Jesus says, now, it's what's, not only is this a sin when you actually murder someone, but if in your heart, if you hate anyone, if you call somebody a moron, a fool, you will be subject to the fire in hell. He's saying it's the sin of the heart. We look at the the outward sin. God looks at the inward sin. It starts from the heart. You know who I am? You know what I am? I am a serial killer. I have hated people in my past. I've murdered my brother, my sister, my mother, and my father, and half of my congregants. You're looking at Someone who should be locked away because he's a serial killer. How many people have you killed this past week? 
Jesus is convicting all of us, all of us. Again, he goes on, verse 27, Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. See, again, it's Christ is saying it's the sin of the heart. Just looking at a woman lustfully, I have already committed adultery. Friends, I should be blinded. I should have gouged my eyes out. Back in the junior high and high school, I was introduced to pornography, and it was, it was I, I felt so guilty, I felt so ashamed. According to Jesus Christ, I am no different than David. Neither are you. We are all convicted, and we have this weight of guilt and shame. It took a long time for me to overcome this, this grip that pornography had on me. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus, that you set me free. But we need to recognize, we need to repent by saying, admitting our guilt and shame. Number two, repent by recognizing God's pain. Repent by recognizing God's pain. Look at verse 4, Psalm 51. Against you, you only have I sinned. You see that doubling of the pronoun you? Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. In the biblical narrative and literature, when, when, when there's a doubling of the word, it's for emphasis. You only against you have I sinned. Come again? I thought... David sinned against Bathsheba by his ad adultery. I thought Dave sinned against Uriah by, by killing him, premeditated murder, right? Okay. And, and, and I thought David sinned against the nation, the people of Israel, as the king who committed these atrocities. But David says, against you, O God, O Lord. You only against you have I sinned. What's going on? Here's, here's what's happening. Any act of sin is ultimately against God. Ultimately. Yes, David sinned against Bathsheba. Yes, David sinned against Uriah. Yes, David sinned against the people of Israel. And yes, David sinned against himself. But ultimately, it is against God because God is every person that you lock eyes with has been made in the image of God. Every person has the seed of divinity, God's, God's, God's stamp on them. I am made in the image of God. So when you sin against me, ultimately you are sinning against God himself. And when we sin against God, it's not just breaking the law. It's not just breaking the commandments. It's breaking God's heart. Yes, did you hear that? When we sin, any act of sin is against God. And when we sin against God, it breaks his heart. You got to recognize that this is causing grief and pain to your Father in heaven. Look at 2 Samuel verse tw uh, chapter 12. This is what the Lord says to King David through the prophet Nathan about his sins. Verse 9. Why did you despise the word of the Lord? By doing what is evil in his eyes. You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because, listen, 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 because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. My goodness. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? The reason David sinned, the reason he committed adultery, the reason he committed murder was he despised the Lord. And that's what God is saying. And every sin is causing grief and pain against the Lord. I got to tell you, um, when my daughter Johanna was 
six and my son three. I don't remember the exact circumstances. They, they were being very naughty. And I tried to reason with them. I tried to correct them. And they wouldn't listen. They were rebellious. They were stiff-necked. So I, in my anger, I, I am admitting it. I'm confessing it. In my anger, I lost my patience. And I disciplined them. I spanked them in the... Okay. And when I saw the pain in the faces of my children, that grieved me. That grieved me. Okay? I was in pain because I saw their pain <laughs> through my discipline. And, and, and here, look, look. Never have I done, done that again. I kept my cool. I kept my patience thereafter, no matter what happened, no matter what happened. Because the last thing I want is to cause pain in those whom I love. So remember. When you repent, true repentance is recognizing that your sins cause pain to your Father in heaven. You've got to feel his pain. Third, repent by grasping God's unfailing love. Write these words. Repent by grasping, holding on to, holding on to unfailing love. That's what true repentance is. Look at verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God according to your unfailing love. You know that unfailing love? It's, it's a really hard word to translate. Okay. It's, say, chesed, with a guttural sound. Say chesed. Okay. Now, when, when you go to different translations, when the Bible translators have different words, different translations for this word, what that means is this word is so rich in its lexical range. There is no one corresponding translating word. So some translations say loving kindness. Others say steadfast love or loving devotion, faithfulness, great mercy. In the NIV, the New International Version translation, it says unfailing love. I'm going to land on two definitions. Therefore, the, the word chesed means unfailing love of God or Loving kindness. God's kindness, that's so loving, it never ends. God's love, so rich, so wise, so deep, it never fails. That's what it means. So David is appealing to God's chesed. According to your mercy, according to your unfailing love, according to your unending loving kindness. Treat me. Do not treat me as I deserve. Do not treat me as my sins deserve. Treat me instead according to your chesed. That's what, that's what we got to do. That's what true repentance is. Look at verse 5 and 6. Really interesting. Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Do you recognize what David is saying? In my mother's womb, before I was born, even there, even then, I was sinful. Question. Are you a sinner because you sin? Or do you sin because you are a sinner? And what's the difference? Are you a sinner because you sin? Meaning you are a sinner, it's you are who you are because of your action and behavior, right? But the statement, do you sin because you are a sinner, that means it's because of who you are at your orientation that you do the behavior. And what David is saying is this, we are at the core in his heart, in our orientation, in our DNA. We are sinners. That's why we sin. We first feel ashamed because of who we are, and that's why we sin, and that's why we feel guilty of our actions. Oh, what a wretched man I am, the Apostle Paul cried. Who will rescue me from this? And that's why Dave goes on to God's chesed, unfailing love, loving kindness. Look at verse 10. Let's read this together one, one more time. Verse 10 through 12. 
Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. That's the solution. That's true repentance. Heavenly Father, don't just fix my behaviors. Fix my heart because it starts from there. I need a heart transplant. I need to be born again. I need to be made new from the inside out. Not so much the behavior out here, but from the inside. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. David is saying this. Yes, he lost the joy of his salvation because he has sinned, but he sinned because he already lost the sight of the joy of salvation. We always choose what we want to choose in any given moment, in any given option. Yes, we, and here David is saying, I lost the sight of the joy of my salvation in you. And that's why I had chosen to commit adultery, to commit murder. Instead, he's saying, restore, may I remember, may I fix my eyes, and may I revel in the joy of my salvation. And the salvation is this. The greatest joy, the greatest blessing your Father in heaven can give you is not just saving you from your sins, but after saving you from your sins, he makes you his child. There is no greater blessing did you know angels are jealous of you and me? Because none of them has been called a child of God. And you and I, we have our sins removed, our shame removed, our guilt removed. We are set free, but God did not stop there. God became your Father in heaven. He says to you and me, my son, my daughter, this is how much I love you. I've given you a new heart in my son, Jesus Christ, and I have adopted you into the family of God. Let me take you to Romans chapter 5. Read this together with me. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrates, not demonstrated as in the past tense. He is demonstrating his love today, right here, right now, in the present tense. His own love for us. How? While we were still sinners. Christ died for us. God knowing that David would commit all these sins, in one occasion, he broke half of the Ten Commandments. He lied. He committed adultery. He murdered. He coveted. Knowing all this already, knowing that David would do this, Christ died for David. Think of your worst sin ever. Don't say it. You know what it is. And the guilt and the shame of it all is weighing you down. Now, check this out. God knowing that you will commit that sin. Even then, even then, that's when Christ died for you. This is how much He loves you. His chesed, unfailing love. His chesed, loving kindness. So grasp God's chesed when you repent. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. The Lord says to you and me, Come now, let us settle the matter. In the old translation, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Your Father in heaven is already waiting, waiting for you and me to come and to repent so that Christ may set us free from our guilt and shame. Remember, repent by admitting your guilt and shame. Repent by recognizing God's pain. Repent by grasping God's unfailing love. Pray with me. Oh, Heavenly Father, merciful God, we hold on to your chesed, your love that never fails, your kindness, that never ends. Time after time, I have failed you. 
Time after time, I have lost the joy of my salvation. I lost the sight of the fact that I am a child of God. I'm a son of the Most High God. And God has given me all the blessings. And that's what's going to help me overcome the temptation to sin. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for you made it possible. I come before you, we come before you, with a broken and a contrite spirit. Restore unto us the joy of your salvation once again. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let us now respond to the rich grace of Jesus Christ with our first fruits and tithes. Jesus is worthy, so let's speak against the sin of greed. Let's speak against our own self reliance. So that's why people don't give to the Lord their first fruits and their tithes and offerings. You and I don't do that. We rejoice in the joy of our salvation, do we not? So let's click Give Online button and bring your offering. Now, friends, already next week Friday, it's the Good Friday. It's one of the most important services of the year. May I encourage you to join that Good Friday here in person, 7 p.m. or via live stream. I pray that you come in person to hear, to see, and to feel and recognize why Jesus Christ, the Son of God, had to suffer, had to agonize, and had to die. Come and join us. Now, following, following the Good Friday, what do we have? Easter Sunday. Let us come and worship the risen Christ, for He is worthy. And come with your friends. It's the most, most glorious occasion of them all. Let us honor the Lord. Now, receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the good Lord turn his countenance, his face towards you, and give you peace, both now and forevermore. And God's people said, Amen.